we all have something you can give and go do it. And, you know, when I had teams at work, you know, it was expected that we all volunteered. I don't care what you work in, but we're all going to volunteer. You know, my whole career, we, this is what we do. So we do it as a team and then you do it separately on, you know, something that you're even more passionate about probably. Hey, it's Breaking Barriers, the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging podcast. We're here for real talk. We're not afraid to go there. And we want you to come away emboldened and energized to take action and make change. We believe our diversity, our differences, when joined together by a common set of ideals, makes us stronger. When I set out to help someone, uh, it is my intention to do just that. I'm not trying to do anything other than meet somebody at their humanity. Welcome all. We're back for another episode of Top Ranks Breaking Barriers, the DEIMB podcast brought to you by our Silver Diversity Sponsor, Rise to Greatness. Thank you so much for your support today. Special episode is brought to you by Kirkwood Community College. They sponsored our single episode here. I'm your co-host, Nick Ford, managing partner at Top Rank. I'm joined by my co-host, Joy Briscoe. Hello, world. Excited to be back again. I know you hear me say this a lot, but this is going to be a good one. Yes. We can't wait to talk to the Michelle today. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, Anthony couldn't be with us today. He had some other appointments he had to couldn't pass up. So um, this is going to be fun today. I, like Joy said, it's it's kind of interesting uh, when you get different perspectives on the show, and, and that's what we're all about. And uh, Michelle has quite a unique journey from, from beginning <laughs> to end. So we're going to talk about that. But before we get started, Michelle, we'd like you to tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, we, we'll put your whole bio on the link when we're done, but we'd like to have our guests kind of okay. tell us about themselves. Well, first of all, thank you for having me and to Anthony. And uh, I've worked with Anthony a couple of times now, which is always fun. And, you know, back many decades ago, <laughs> I was born with a rare form of dwarfism. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, there wasn't uh, the mindset that it is today, if you're different in any way that, you know, you should have the same opportunities and afforded you and, and education, et cetera. And, you know, I was very blessed to be not only born in this country, the U.S., where, you know, we are, uh, we do have opportunities. Uh, I was also born into a family with parents that definitely supported me in every way, just like my other siblings. And so, you know, I didn't know I was going to be a little person until I went to kindergarten. I was just like everybody else. Uh, and I, I really didn't notice that my younger sister was taller than me already. I, it never really dawned on me. But when I went to kindergarten, that's when the kids pointed out, you know, that I looked different, which I found interesting. You know, that first day of kindergarten, I was so excited to go to school like my big brother. And I went bebopping in the room like I owned the place. And uh, and then all that started. And it just totally took my breath away because I, I didn't understand, you know, what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And so when I got in the car, I'm sure my mom had waited five years for that question is, is, is there something wrong with me? Because everybody told me that. And I'm sure she waited because that was the first time I'd ever seen my mom hesitate. And, you know, she just explained, you know, as parents do, you know, we're all born with our own unique uh, ways of doing things and how we look, how we think, et cetera. And, and so, you know, um, education was always stressed in our family and a big impact on my life was when my mom read the Reader's Digest one day and at the very bottom of the Reader's Digest, it always had a little blurb. And it talked about an organization called Little People of America, and it's for people under four feet ten, four foot ten, like myself. Um, and I'd always ask my mom, "Am I the only one?" Because you know, back sixties, seventies, even you could argue eighties, you really didn't see, you know, you didn't travel and all that, and have the television that you have today. You know, back then you had three channels. Remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe not you, Joy. I do. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, and that was always my question, and so. You know, she got me in that organization. It changed my life because, you know, I met people just like myself from all over the world. And, and you know, I, I knew pretty early on that I was going to have to get an education. I wasn't going to be a, a, a laborer or any type of labor, manual labor type of job. So, you know, in LPA, it's really stressed as well and in my family. And so I went on and got a master's in business. And then I started my career. 
after I co-opted IBM in graduate school, I started my career at Caterpillar in Peoria, Illinois, the big earth moving equipment manufacturer. And my dad worked there and subsequently my sister worked there as well and my uncles. So it was like a family affair. We were definitely yellow blood. And I had a terrific career and about 20, 21 years in, I, uh, my dream job came open. I've been involved in not-for-profit since I was a teenager. It's a passion of mine and Caterpillar is a passion and Caterpillar has a global foundation, but it doesn't come open, the position to lead, it doesn't come open very often. And um, it came open and my boss told me about it. And um, so I interviewed and lo and behold, I, I got my dream job. And so the littlest employee uh, took on this big global public facing foundation that does fabulous work with their partners on the ground. And, um, you know, that had a profound impact on me more than I could have ever imagined. It changed me in many ways. And then as retirement was drawing close within a couple of years, I wanted to do more work in the not-for-profit space and also do public speaking, which I've done before. And I wrote a book called Looking Up. <laughs> mm. So uh, I've been retired. I'm in my sixth year now, and I'm still involved in social impact work with the One Campaign, which works for those in severe poverty and some other uh, organizations as well. And DNI, of course, uh, is also deeply ingrained in my heart in many ways. And I talk about that and faith. And so I've had quite a journey. And uh, I like uh, the favorite part is meeting the people, of course. And, uh, you know, especially with students and children, you know, if I can do this, so can you. And, and I think we're missing a lot of that in today's world. Michelle, I love that when you started this, you talked about that moment of kind of recognizing maybe that there was something unique about you. Mm -hmm. And then you said, you know, you thought to yourself, like, am I the only one? And your mom had the foresight, which I love, too, because I, I, I think <laughs> other generations, sometimes the fact that your mom had the foresight to understand that you needed to ex experience like representation mm -hmm. and that there are other people out there that doing great things and things like that. So how, what type of influence did that have on you once you had that, exp that experience with, I wrote down little people's, Amer little people's America. Is that what it is? Little people of America. It's called LPA. LPA. Mm -hmm. So what, what type LPA. of influence did LPA have on you? Because I just, Oh, it, you know, I got in it when I was starting all my orthopedic surgeries at Hopkins. You know, I had about 20, 30 years of surgeries, and uh, as some little people do, some don't. Um, and so, you know, here I am 12 and 13, and I'm spending my summers in body casts. <laughs> and so it came at a great time uh, because my friends I met in LPA were going through everything This also. We all had the same doctor, basically. And, you know, we all had the same aspirations about going to school and what could we do. We, we really didn't see limits on ourselves. And LPA is very, very open and good about, you know, we, you got to go out there and, and do this and do that. And education is key. Connecting is key. And, you know, while you can see one of my challenges, of course, which is being a little person, and it does draw a lot of attention, <laughs> as you can imagine, if, if, more than one of us especially go out in public. But it really brought home to me, there's so many challenges people have that you can't see. And I did a TED talk and I talk about that. And you know, asking for help is a strength, not a weakness is the name of the TED talk. And in the book, Looking Up, you've heard about you have these epiphanies in the shower. And I really did when I was trying to think of the title with the publisher. Looking Up is not only uh, literally, obviously, do I look up to people because I'm only four feet tall. But I look up to everybody uh, anyway because we all have value. And I want to get to know you. And I think we all can contribute. So figuratively, I look up to everyone. And especially working with extreme poverty with the Caterpillar Foundation, you know, you go to the, anywhere and people who are living in, I mean, deep, deep poverty less than $2 a day. And you talk to the mothers, they have the same aspirations as we do. 
they want their children to be successful, to go to school, be happy. It's, it's the same wherever you go. And I don't know that we all recognize that. And then you have, you know, people who are having a mental illness that you cannot see. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's hard to understand when you've never experienced it. You can't see it. And how do you fix it? It, 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 you know, it's, it's quite a challenge. And I, I don't, I can't directly relate to it, but I'm open to walking with you on these challenges. And I talk about that in the TED Talk. You know, if we would support each other, we don't have to understand every single aspect, but we have to open ourselves up to our challenges. Joy, you have challenges as well. We all, we all do here on the call. And some you can see and some you can't. But it's funny how we always focus on our differences. Mm -hmm. And we focus on it not to embrace them. And that's what I really like to talk about. I know we have differences. And let's embrace them and make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do a lot of my speaking on. I love that. And look what's happened in the world since October. I love that because, you know, you kind of hit home with us even, right? When we're both disabled vets. A lot of mine you can't see. Matter of fact, if you watch Anthony, who's a double leg amputee walk, and you see me walk, you would think I was the one that had the, the issues that, that him. Yeah. <laughs> I know he's amazing. He's amazing. <laughs> I mean, he moves better than I do. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit about. You were also a U.S. delegate to the United States Commission on the Status of Women. Tell me a little yes. bit about that. That's that's kind of intriguing. I, I, something I'd not heard Boy, of. Boy, that so. was it. Was you know, <laughs> it was to me too <laughs> when I got the call and the letter. I was in my office at work and. I knew about uh, the Commission on the Status of Women because uh, we did work with the UN on different projects, and I was very familiar with UN Women, which is another organization and part of it. And so they were pulling the commission together, and they wanted um, a delegate to represent the United States and what we have been working on, and you know, like from Caterpillar, et cetera, and other partners that we talk about. Because we talk a lot about our partners because they're the ones that actually – execute the grants and are on the ground. So, you know, I went to Washington. I've been to the UN before, you know, UN week, it's called UNGA week, is in September every year. It's a big week out there. And uh, this was uh, aside from that. And so, you know, I got to speak with the other delegates of the country about what they were working on, where the gaps were, etc. And then when the day came where we kind of pulled things together, we went actually into the UN and I sat behind where it said United States. And uh, it took me a couple minutes, to be honest, to sit down because that was was unexpected, to be honest. And yet I knew that it meant a lot. People look to the United States in leadership and in support. And so I knew that from meeting the other partners, et cetera, that we had a good story to tell, but I knew that it could be even better if we collaborated. And so I was looking forward to that. And so throughout the day, that's what we worked on. And it was, it was amazing. And out of all the badges I had during my seven plus years in the foundation, when I retired, that was the one I took with me, actually. I still have it. (laughs) So I love that you even, you, like you said, you got to do this really cool thing by work for this global, um, just massive company that Caterpillar mm-hmm. is. But then also within that, you you found yourself. And I think a lot of times in this work, you often do find yourself going over to the nonprofit side. Where's the philanthropic yeah. side? Where's the feel good side? Where can I actually take some of the business connections, but see our actually impact happen. And so like, what are some things that while you were the director of the corporation, like what are some things you did that you were really proud of and that maybe drew your, um, drew your attention based off your experiences and things of that nature? You know, what surprised me, uh, I'm not deeply into politics, uh, I'm more into the subjects that they're discussing. And as you get into solving, people say world hunger, we say 
poverty. And we have a lot of poverty in the United States, by the way. People have no idea mm -hmm. how much poverty that we have in the United States, mm -hmm. for instance. And then, of course, you go into the underdeveloped countries and it's exponentially. Uh, they don't even have water, a yeah. lot of them. Yeah. So for me, it became apparent that, well, prior to that role, I worked, I would say, at the grassroots with the, the organizations on the ground actually executing, which is great because nothing happens without that. However, if you want to make exponential change, two things we were lacking. We needed to work at the advocacy level, which is at the government levels of wherever we were working. And we needed to have the three-legged stool. We had the corporation, us, which is the private sector. We have the partnerships on the ground, the cost sector. We needed the government sector, the public sector. Because as they change laws or legislation, that allows us to make exponential change. And I'll give an example. We were working in Rwanda, and our goal was to get one district access to water because the girls were walking all day for water, those yellow 40 pound jugs, they weren't going to school. And that's not a good outcome ever. Is that a good outcome? So we needed to bring water in. So, and we had several partners that wasn't an issue. What the issue was the people lived on top of these very tall, hills and small mountains that the girls walked up and down all day like the car barely made it and here they are walking carrying water and the water was at the bottom oh wow so uh, us and others caterpillar was not the only one involved uh and the not-for-profit worked with the government of that district and they got power in there electricity so then we were able to partner and have a pipeline put up the mountain and it had electricity to pump the water 1500 meters, which oh, is a lot. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's then a steep, uh... the other partner could house the water and then the people in the village could bring their water jugs, etc., and get fresh water every day. Nice. Mm. So it took the government to run the electricity. It took the not-for-profits and us to to emphasize with them how uh, their lives would change if they had access to water, both health and also going to school. And that's the three-legged stool, the public, private, and cost sector. And I really formed an appreciation for that once I got into that role. And I call that the grass tops. Mm -hmm. Advocacy is the grass tops. So with the U.S., for instance, we partnered with LISC, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, and they work in a lot of the impoverished neighborhoods. And so we supported them to open an office in Peoria where uh, Caterpillar was headquartered at the time. And we had one of the top 100 poorest zip codes just three miles from our headquarters. And we wanted to do something with that neighborhood to bring them up. And so LISC is actually a line item on the federal budget. And so we strongly support their work. So I would go to, you know, our representatives and not specifically say that I supported funding or a specific bill because that's policy, but I could advocate for the people in the neighborhood we were trying to help and that the work of LISC really makes an impact in that area. So that's the difference. And it's, I worked with legal a long time on this advocacy so that we didn't ever cross the line with the foundation work. And so it was a lot more legal than I had anticipated. And then, you know, as we invested around the world, you know, anytime money crosses borders, there's so many legalities. You know, we always worked through intermediaries and invested the money there, and then they took it from there. There were a lot of things I, I learned about. And then knowing the difference and getting grass tops and grass roots to work together and the three-legged stool, mm -hmm. that really is what uh, 
I think one of my um, greatest accomplishments was because of all the all the partners, you know, also that we had. I just happened to be in the position at the time. Nice. Why Why do you feel it's so important? And we feel the same way, but that those of us in these positions use our platform I mean, because everything we're talking about is your platform, right? I mean, your platform to help others, your platform to reduce poverty. Mm -hmm. Why is it so important that, I mean, you, like you said, you easily could have just not done that route, but you did, you went that route anyway and you, and you yeah. used that platform. That was your dream right. job. Why is that so important? Yeah, it was, Yeah. you know, I, we do not have a level playing field yet. And like I said, we definitely are great at highlighting our differences. And my platform is to highlight the collaborations. One thing I believe that's not, not helping us is the extremes on the left and the right. And it's being very divisive because if you talk to most people that I talk, who I talk to are more in the middle in that we want to move forward and, and help and whether it's about race, religion, sexuality, um, that's a big one today for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And I support and um, I know people have their beliefs. I, I never would bother that. Uh, but we also have to have the people who don't believe the way you do have their right to that. And still we support each other. And there's a big conflict there. And like I said, you can see a big difference in me with my size, but there's much more to me than that. And my mom always said, you know, Michelle, you remember you're Michelle. And, and when someone says, Michelle, what, what are you? What, what should we call you? I go, you call me Michelle. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what you call me. Uh, who just happens to be a little person, a test speaker, a retiree, you know, all these other things. And yet we really want to focus on that. If you were to go out with me, I guarantee you, you would know wherever I was walking by how, where people were looking. And the joke in my family and friends is, well, they would hear me first, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, but, you know, we have become so divisive and the politics is, is both ways. It's driving that, but it's also the cause of it. Mm -hmm. And so I talk in the middle and I support, if you listen to my TED talk, I will walk beside you and I will support you the best that I can, but I will not go against someone for something that is, is, is who they are, as long as it's, you know, not immoral or, you know, any, you know, I'm not going to like what's happening to the Jewish state right now, this is the latest thing, right? It, remember George Floyd? That was absolutely um, just uh, atrocious. And, you know, have we changed from that? Not nearly as much as we should. In my, This is just my opinion. And now we have what Hamas did. And there's people, you know, supporting that uh, type of... Um, whatever you want to call it. I want to be careful here, but you know, I, I would support, you know, the Jewish state as, as I would want them to support me as a Lutheran, but I know there's people who don't believe that. Michelle, so how, how do you can think we still we... live oh, together go though? Go ahead. Huh? That's exactly what I was going to say. When, when, when right. everything in the media and everything yep. seems to be so polarizing and it, there's almost like, there's this push for you to make these very extreme decisions. So either you support, in your example, like you gotta support Israel or Hamas. You can't just say like, right. you know what, what about humanity, right? Which I think is kind of even where you're right. getting to is that we've really- Yeah, you know, exactly. You know, and, and the media plays a big role in this. Make no mistake. They, they play a huge role in this. Mm -hmm. And, that for that example, you know, why is it the Israelis and the Palestinians when Hamas is in the middle causing all the, the issues and, and really started it? Um, and at the end of the day, 
before October, you know, there was peace over there. Did they agree on everything? Absolutely not. But were they living together, uh, you know, borders and, and going about their business? And I don't know all the details, so I don't want to get real deep into it. I want to keep it high level, meaning I support that we respect both of those sides. And I won't speak to a mass because that's a, a whole nother rabbit hole. But, you know, we did have peace, didn't we? Was it perfect? No. But were we tolerant of it? Yes. Now, you could say the same about race in our country right now, right? Think about it. We are tolerating it, but don't we have a, quite an underlying systemic issue there? I would definitely say there's a lot do. of parallels, isn't there? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of parallels there. And, you know, we have to continue to understand each other, work together. And when I grew up, we, it wasn't, I said, you said, well, you're wrong then. It was more, we just collaborated and respected each other. Now I feel like if you don't believe what I believe, then you're wrong. And I'm going to prove you're wrong. And I'm going to go to the end of the world to prove that you're wrong. And I don't understand that. I, I don't understand that because I'm not saying you're wrong. But I'd like to understand more. Does that make sense? Uh, you know, we, we do what's called facilitation. Or am I off base? I mean, I don't want to get real no, I, I think you're a lot of calls because I'd say the same thing to anybody if they were sitting across the table. From no, me. I, I think you're on the right page. You know, we, we do a lot of facilitation. We get asked a lot like, well, don't you have feelings on stuff? Because we come in neutral and and listen, understand. Yeah, I knew, yeah, exactly. And we all have feelings. We all have opinions. But it doesn't mean that my opinion has to be the only right one in the world either. Right? I mean, right. If, if we can have that dialogue exactly. and have those tough conversations, I, I think. But don't you there. like a good debate and discussion? Like, tell me how you feel. Like a homeless person. How many people think so poorly of, a, of the homeless that they say, oh, they just need to get a job. They just, you know all these other derogatory comments or and you know if you really study homelessness many of them have a mental illness many of them had some bad luck got lost their job or their home or something and it's very hard think how many people are struggling just trying to make their bills but then if you were to lose your job or some major house problem happened and you don't have the money or the car you can be homeless very quickly. And yet we have a judgment of them and drive right by them or walk by them when you don't know their story. And we worked hard in, on homelessness as well. And some, I, I, and it was a surprise to me, some people want to live on the street. And that was really hard for me to understand. Because my goal was to help every single person not be homeless. And that it turned out that's not our goal. And I was wrong. <laughs> but how do we get people, instead of making comments or, or hurting them, how do we say, you know, how can I help you? Do you know the Peoria Rescue Mission is down the street? They can give you a bed tonight. Can I take you there? You, you know, there's a switch there. And... And I don't know their problem or how they got there, but I can try to help them. And like you said, I don't have to agree with everything they believe in and vice versa. But that's a human. That is a and human. And that's where my heart is. I always thought we're supposed to leave the earth better than when we came. That's, at the end of the day, what I drive for. Yeah. I so not to pick sides, <laughs> not to pick sides. Yeah. How do you think we take that energy and multiply it? Because it just seems to be so lacking right now. How do you think we take that, the energy of we, like, we don't have to agree on everything, but we do agree on humanity and we do agree on, agree on respecting each other right. as having the, um, the right to have our own political, but like, especially that's really what, United States is supposed to be founded on, right? Is the 
freedom of Absolutely. speech or whatever have you. And so now to be in these positions where everything is so polarized, where you can't even really have mm -hmm. conversation to find likeness or even conversation to understand each other anymore. How do you think, what are some things even in your experience? Cause I love, I like your analogy of the three legs, right? Like that they have to work together. Cause I agree with that mm -hmm. too. And when I was reading pick your- Pick a leg, pick, right? Pick a leg. You heard that pick Nick? A leg. Pick a leg. <laughs> and you know, get involved. You know, if you really, what are you passionate about? And everybody has assets, whether financial skills, collaboration, uh, access to people that can make a difference. We all have something you can give and go do it. And, you know, when I had teams at work, you know, it was expected that we all volunteered. I don't care what you work in, but we're all going to volunteer. You know, my whole career, we, this is what we do. So we do it as a team and then you do it separately on, you know, something that you're even more passionate about probably, but and also we have to be open. We are really opinionated, aren't we? I mean, with social media, you can hide behind that and say anything you want. But when you're standing in front of somebody who you're trying to bash or, or bring down, it's a lot harder, but they do it. And so social media has really transformed things, but I also think it can be used in good ways. We did, we used social media a lot with our work and we usually made it personal. We would tell a story about someone, how they got in that situation, what their issues were, and then what partners, you know, helped them and where they are today. And when you make it personal it, and you know somebody personally, it's really hard to tease them or speak poorly of them. You know, in school, when kids really know somebody or, or even sort of know somebody, it's a lot harder to tease them, isn't it? Yeah. Because you know them and your humanity kicks in. So we're grouping people into groups and it's easy to bash the group. So don't, don't group all, don't keep grouping people for one reason. There's much more to that person than that. And, you know, we have a lot of dimensions to us. I mean, you two, tell me something that I wouldn't know by looking at you. Joy, you go first. Uh, I played violin for many years, first string. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. for you. Thanks. You still do it? Nah. I got Once I got in high school, somebody told me it wasn't cool. I, okay. I wish I was stuck with it. <laughs> you know, our local school goes to the animal shelter, and the, they play for the animals. Good. They sit in front of them and play. And it calms them. Oh, good. That's a skill you have. Wow. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's mine. <laughs> yeah. And what's yours? Oh, I could steal it. I, I actually played the violin at one point, too. Um, and same thing. I quit because it wasn't cool. It wasn't no, cool? No, but my, <laughs> let's see. That's from, you wouldn't know by looking at me? Um, yeah. Oh, geez. I grew up dirt poor. Absolutely dirt poor. I mm -hmm. uh, probably lived in. So you have an appreciation. Probably lived in 10 homes by the time I was 10. Really? Mm. Yep. At least. It shaped you though, didn't it? It did. It did. I'll never forget where I came from. That's for sure. And do you go back and help? I do. I do. Yeah. As do, as it do my parents. It makes a difference, doesn't it? I, With no judgment. No, absolutely none. Yeah. Um, That's how you do it. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's humbling. It is, it's, it's, it's humbling, but it's also rewarding because, right. you know, if I can help someone not go through that, then to me, that's right. That's worth it. And we need more of that at every level, at your family, your friends, your churches, your neighborhoods, your companies, your civic organizations. Um, and, What's interesting, you said, how do we do that? If COVID didn't teach us but one thing, it taught us that the world is one, didn't it? Like, we are one people, <laughs> whether we like it or not. That little 
thing that you couldn't see by the naked eye, the virus, brought the world to its knees. Mm -hmm. The world. And we put humanity first for the first time in a long time, probably in the United States. I, for me, it was probably since 9-11. Remember when that happened and we were ready to go get them, remember? For about two years. We were going to go get them. Yep. And not until then have we done that. Like truly come together as one. The world had to work together as one. Now, we went about it in different ways, but we respected each other, didn't we? And we put the people first at the end of the day. You know, we, we always talk about we have a global economy, but I think that gets lost a lot is the global society concept, mm -hmm. right? We're not oh, all one people, yeah, sure. and we are. I mean, yep. We are one. We have one planet, and, you know, we all have to make this work. So, mm -hmm. you know, it has to start for each person, and I talk about that endlessly when I speak. And when I leave after I speak, before I leave, I always ask, so what is your mark going to be when you leave here? What are you going to do? You should have a plan and then bring everybody with you and have more than one plan and work on as many things as you want to work on, but try to make a difference with, with no judgment. And it's hard not to judge. I judge. We, we, it's human nature, and we have to fight against it. But I'll, I'll be there with you. I love that. I love that. I, I, I like that you have a commitment to be there with people too, because I think that that does, that's an, a testament to, you know, people as they're going through challenges. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I know our internet's funny here lately, but no, I like that, Michelle, that you are a testament to saying that you'll actually be present with people too and um, whatever have you. I think that that's so valuable because sometimes people talk, mm -hmm. talk it, but then to actually say, no, I'm going to be there with you through it. And so what are, what would be as, as a person that has done some transformational work and talk, and we've talked a little bit about like, how do we get to this place of oneness or how do we kind of come away from this period of where everything is just so polarized. And so from an organizational standpoint, right? You've worked mm -hmm. in organizations. How do you right. how do you address that within organizations? Because we talked about it from like an external lens, but like right. within an organization. Because a lot of times Nick and Anthony and I were actually working with companies who have employees with very different views from every yep. scope coming to one organization, one entity with one mission, one objective, and one goal. And so from your perspective, Michelle, how do you apply those concepts when it comes to working in an organization? Sometimes you have to ask yourself, should we all be in one? Because if people aren't passionate about it, they shouldn't be forced into it. I'll give an example. The Caterpillar, uh, in particular in the Peoria area, but the whole company, we have a very strong United Way presence. And to the point where whatever you donate to the United Way during the two-week campaign, the Caterpillar Foundation matches it, dollar for dollar. And then that money goes into the United Way, and then it does an assessment of wherever the chapters are of the, of the community, and they do a, you know, a, a free assessment, no opinions, just all data and so forth, and talking to organizations, et cetera, to find out what that community needs. And then that money is invested that way. And we keep going up in our donations every year. Do people totally agree with or know where the money is exactly going? They absolutely have access to it. But they know that in their community, whatever facility they're at, they will support the local community. Now, when you go past that, within each company, um, most companies now have ERGs or some name, you know, employee resource group, affinity group, there's all kinds of names. So whatever you're passionate about, you should then go into one of those groups as well, but not be the only, like, for instance, if you're, 
if you're Asian and you go into the Asian one, don't just go into the Asian one. Like, go to all the events of other groups because that's how you get to meet people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, there is no LPA one at Caterpillar. There's maybe, out of 90,000 people, there's maybe two or three little people. <laughs> so we don't really have a group, and that's okay. But I would go to other groups. And so I never, like, put myself in one little closet of where I want to be. And you have to be open to that. So even within a company, you have, for instance, the United Way, where we all contribute. And then you have the ERG groups that you can be active in as many as you want. And then you have your life outside of work. And we would have people that were being, their children were in Special Olympics. That was very passionate for them. You know, there's all kinds of levels that you can uh, be active in. But you also have to decide what it is that you want. And I learned about a lot of different areas because I wanted to. I really learned a lot about homelessness and some other areas that I had no idea about. And I came away better and a person and a better understanding as the president of the foundation who to go and help us with these issues. And then when I came into that role, we decentralized the decision-making where we would get a group of people at each facility and they would tell us within our strategy, which was basic human needs education and the environment, what does your community need from a grant standpoint outside of the United Way? You tell us what your community needs. And we decentralized it. Then when they told us and they had some organizations and my team would vet it, you know, legally and all that other stuff you have to do. And then if it all worked out, we would invest. So they had a role in it. And it's funny because a lot of them then, it drove even more engagement at that level, at the community level, because we, we brought them in. I don't know what Little Rock needs, but my facility does, or they're going to find out what it is. I'm very happy with that. Mm-hmm. So you really have to step in. Don't You have to lean in, you as Cheryl Sandberg in. says. Yeah. You have to lean in, and I talked to her about that. Uh, you lean in. And also, I say you have to look up. You look up to people. Mm -hmm. You look up to your opportunity. It's up to you how, you how you feel, too. I mean, talk about getting judged. Every time I go out, people just see my size. I mean, I don't get weighted on or... You know, people look right over me. I have to, like, speak up. Hey, I'm next in line here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> or you go try to buy a car, and they're looking at you like, Who, what? You know, they don't even come over. You're like, just so, bring the car. <laughs> yeah, just, just bring the car, man, will you? I'm, exactly, I'm good. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, it's, uh, but you can't, you, you just have to keep, you have to lean in. You can't do this on the peripheral. You know, and I'm a person that leans in. And it's harder for some people, and I get that. But think about some things that are happening to you that you don't like, and how can you help that? And then how do you help with other things that you can't see that people are struggling with? So we have a listener question from Tony in Baltimore. And he, Tony. He's asking. Baltimore, so, my stomping ground for Johns Hopkins. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's asking with, with all the news recently about attacks on DEI and this type of work. What, what advice do you have for those of us that do this work to move forward? Well, you know, I will give an opinion on that. I don't understand that to some extent. Um, I still think we're in this phase of if you don't count it, it's not going to get done. I don't think we're far enough along in any category uh, not to still understand, do we have a presence and a representation or don't we? And an understanding, mostly understanding, to be honest. And so I think, though, that some groups have taken it so far off the side, off the rails, that now it's caused us to push back the other way. And that's what's happened in so many categories of our politics today. There's a few on each end that's pulling, and so everybody's doing this and clamming up. And that's what's happening. We've, we've polarized it instead of collaborating with it. 
we have polarized it. Pick a category, and I'll I'll tell you how we polarize. I mean, pick. You guys know, and this you know supposed five percent or less on each side has changed our world. Mm. And they're trying to now group us all to go one way. Pick you know all the extreme. Michelle, I I I love that's a great point too because they are um, really trying to. It's a response, right? Like feeling like. DEI efforts had gone too far and they weren't comfortable with it. And so there's this big, huge, strong reaction to it. And I, w- I was joking, I made a post this morning because I was reading about, and this is a little more frivolous, but the Oscars, right? And oh, yeah. there's a big uproar. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> what what yeah. I mean, because it's relevant, right? Like there's this big uproar around Barbie, but I kind of get it because the whole, like I enjoyed the Barbie movie and I really, was not necessarily, and I'm a Barbie girl. I grew up. I'm a Barbie girl. Barbie, mm-hmm. Barbie hair. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but um, and you, you look great, by the way. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You too. And so, thank you. Definitely wanted to see the movie, but I wasn't expecting it to have the type of societal message that it has. And so, then for whoever is over the Oscars to go, yeah, and we're gonna give the award to Ken. <laughs> Like, did you watch the movie? Yeah, the whole movie was about. <laughs> yeah, you know, I did not see the movie, so I was not okay. aware. You gotta watch it. But then when they came out, I was. I understand why people. Are yes. Like really, but you know what? There's only also been was it two women directors or one that have even won an Oscar That's true. for directing? That's true. So if you think about it, step back. There's a deeper problem. Here. Yes. Yes. Right. But what do we, we polarize on a doll. Yeah. <laughs> but then if you didn't want to see the movie, don't see it. Yes. I'm okay with that. Exactly. But then they make it where nobody should. It's like, no. Exactly. If you want to pay the money to see the movie, go see it. Yes. And Take I'm, away what you want. And it's a movie. And They're not telling movie. you to whatever. Just, yeah, I just, it amazes me how people just take one, like, all this banning of books. If you don't want to read the book, don't read Just it. Just don't read it. I had um, one, my my stepmom is a school teacher, and so her, mm. my 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 dad and I, we were having this uh, discussion the other day because sometimes when people do hear that, they they get into the rhetoric. And so my dad was repeating something, and I just paused. Oh, I probably will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just paused right there, and I turned to my stepmom, who again was a gold star, which is like a higher level teacher for our community. I mean, she was outstanding. Okay. And I asked her, I said, in, in your years of teaching, how how often did you have a student that was reading these books that they're talking about or whatever have you, or the ones that they're so concerned that are going to indoctrinate, so we got to ban them. And you know what she said? Never. Never. And I just turned back to my dad and I said, so that the situations that are being allowed to make us all stand at these very opposite ends For of the everybody. spectrum. Yeah. yeah. And there's nuance. They're not they're not occurring on that frequent of a basis mm-hmm. that we should even be having these broad right. stroke, you know, decisions made for these isolated incidents. It was just it was just such an I she was like, Yeah, you're right. What, what Joy, don't we talk about, Joy? Happen. Yeah. Unicorns, <laughs> dragons, they're all make believe. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And you know, why can't we all talk like this? Yeah. Why does it why does it have to fall off a cliff yeah. on one side and it changes the other ninety five percent of us? Yeah. Yeah. Think about it. We gotta get a handle on this and you know, write the pendulum that, you know, it's okay to have opinions, but we have to, you know, let people have their other opinions as well. And that's where I don't see it happening as much. Or you or you don't feel that you can voice it. And voice it, but don't um, expect the other, everybody in your town to agree with it. Just respect it. That's what we've lost. We have lost that. And in politics, it's dividing our country severely. Sure, we need to cue the... And uh, I see no end in, I see no end in sure, we need to cue the, artist, the respect song for Aretha Franklin, right? Exactly. 
Well, you know yeah. what? We're, we're, I know we're drawing down a time, but we have really, I mean, talking to I may you, have to see the Barbie movie now and see what's going <laughs> you on. You got to see it. If you watch the Barbie movie and then hear them say, well, Ken gets the award. Because the whole premise of the movie. It's Barbie, right? Yeah. And it's very, well, it talks about just being a patriarchal society, yeah. basically. It's, it's heavily ingrained into you, Barbie in her world is centered. And then she comes to our world where Ken is very much centered and it, and I don't want to ruin everything else. Okay. You got to see it. You got to see it. And then I may have to go see it. Now. You got to see saw it. Oppenheimer. Yeah. I heard that was good. I haven't seen that. That was, that was an eye opener. Was an eye opener. Nick, have you seen yeah, it? Yeah. I mean, how the government I have not seen that one yet. turned it around yeah. at the end and the guy did what he was supposed to do. And then, Oh, we're going to make you the bad guy now. <laughs> Hey, that we can have a whole yeah. nother show about this. <laughs> yeah, boy. Yeah, we could. I don't want a lot of hate mail, though. I got right, some right. guy imitating me because of my TED Talk and all that other stuff. So it's quite interesting. Oh, no. See, the, the world we live in today. Well, we are glad that you were our guest. I today. love this. I'd love to do it again. Any other topic, guys? This yeah. is great. Yeah, we appreciate you. Nick, do you have anything? I know we have to thank our sponsors and... Yeah, just a, another yes, big shout out to our silver, our silver diversity sponsor, Rise to Greatness. Um, might want to look them up. Like they do that. a lot of stuff that, that you're talking about as well. With, with uh, I'm going to read on that. Um, mm -hmm. Thank and you. then our uh, episodal sponsor is Kirkwood Community College. And our Friends of Breaking Great. Barriers, Community Savings Bank, Tyler Lincoln Barnes, DDS. Again, a like special that. thanks to Community College, uh, Community College, Kirkwood Community College, our episode sponsor. We appreciate you. We'd love to hear from you. Hit us up. Send your questions, comments, suggestions. To info at top rank talent solutions .com or info at top rank culture .com. Great. So, um, again, well, keep looking up because the view is great. Uh, we appreciate yeah. it. You know, and uh, we're on all the podcast audio I platforms, and you can even watch our videos live on our website. Uh, again, special thanks to our listeners. Can't have a show without you. So we like spreading this word and and using our platform. So uh, we drop episodes twice per month on your favorite platforms on YouTube. Search for the Breaking Bears DIB podcast. Joy, you want to take us out? Yeah, thank you all so much, Michelle. Again, thank you for joining us. Look for us um, at all of your, as Nick said, on all the 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 um, all of the podcast sites. If I can actually thank get you. my words out today, <laughs> and again, continue to break barriers, Maurice. I know we used to have that the little sound, the psh, break barriers with top rank, Michelle. Continue to break barriers as well, and thank you. And I will. You guys, too. Thank you for everything, and I, I greatly appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Come on. Advancing equity is not a one-year project. It's a generational commitment. There are too few people in the world willing to be the domino. Too few people willing to take that fall.